Hey everybody, welcome to the True Crime Squad. This is Katie Weaver. I'm here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. Happy Monday. Yeah, it is Monday <laughs> already. You sound super enthused. I you know, I just all I can think about is De Belvalo Court today. Uh yeah, me too. It's all I can think about. And here's why. Because on Thursday, basically, as they were adjourning court, they were learning that they had uh, the results of that last DNA back from the fancy schmancy lab that it was sent out to. And then on Friday, late afternoon, they scheduled a hearing for today, for Monday. Yeah. Uh, It's at 2.30 at the Fremont County Courthouse. We are going to be there. We will uh, live face it, live book it Mm -hmm. (laughs) from our... uh, our Facebook group. Uh, we are very intrigued. We're very intrigued. Yeah. Yeah. Because this, there's all kinds of um, hearings scheduled out between now and the beginning of the trial. Uh, this is not one of them. So something oh, happened, yes. something changed, something. And the fact that, that DNA showed up. What, what did that tell somebody? Right. What did that tell somebody? I will tell you our hopest of hopey hopes. And yeah. this is absolutely projection. No Total speculation. to the bank at all. Total speculation. It's our hope upon all hopes that the DNA on that tape, what it is, I should say, it is more hairs that they found on some of the duct tape that uh, wrapped up JJ's body. Yes. And I'm going to tell, say this. We've been saying all along that that's where the DNA would be that would crash this case. We've been saying that since we they found JJ. In the very beginning, yeah. And indeed, there's there's DNA there that is. Uh, so the Idaho State Lab found those hairs, but they said they did not have the technology to extract any DNA from them. No. Uh, the Idaho State Lab should have never been in charge of this in the first place. Unfortunately, they just don't have the tech, the time. I the tried anything. to tell the judge, but uh, there mm-hmm. was no listening going on. Yeah. They themselves said we should not be doing this. Uh, and then they ended up doing it. So anyway, mm-hmm. the prosecution has paid a very pretty penny to, mm-hmm, to send this out to this other lab who turned it around back to them really quickly. It's our hope beyond all hopes that that DNA is Lori's. And that that's the final piece of evidence that Lori's attorneys needed to convince her to take a plea. Yep. Because, uh, and it's possible that, uh, you know, they'll take the death penalty off the table. Maybe they'll take some of the charges away, like Tammy's charges. It's possible. Uh, Just possible, though. Again, we are completely predicting and projecting. We don't know. We do know that her attorneys really, really wanted her to take a deal. Yes, that's been their plan all along. They've been very clear, very open about that in court Mm -hmm. multiple times. They've said repeatedly that uh, in death penalty cases, uh, that if you make it clear to court, you have lost. Yep. And so it's our hope beyond all hopes that this is evidence that uh, convinced them to convince her to take a deal. And that now we'll just be looking at uh, the prosecution prosecuting Chad. Again, we don't know. We're just saying that this is our greatest hope. Yep. Yeah. We're pretty excited because we know something, something has changed in order for this hearing to happen so quickly. Yep. So we're going to keep you posted. Yep, we are. We'll let you know, but uh, we'll see what's up. Something's up. Mm -hmm. But beyond that. We thought it would be kind of fun to do an episode today. We do these every once in a while where instead of one main case, we just do six segments, six uh, brief segments and bring you six stories that might be stories that aren't really enough to put together a whole, uh, you know, main show on, but that are interesting or sometimes entertaining or, you know, just uh, thought provoking enough that we wanted to bring them to you. So that's what we're going to do. So, Christy, you are going to kick us off with a racial injustice segment. Yes. This man 
is Clarence. Sorry, I can't remember. Clarence Moses L. His last name gets me every time. This is Clarence Moses L. Let me tell you a little bit about Clarence. Clarence is set to receive $2 million for the 28 years he spent behind bars for a rape he did not commit. Wow. Um, there's. I'll get to what's happening right now, but let me just tell you. Um, he's due, they, they're, they're paying him $70,000 for each year he spent behind bars, apparently. Um, wow. So... What happened is that he was convicted in 1987 of a really serious and violent rape. Um, the attacker in this case broke into this woman's apartment while she was sleeping. He beat her, drugged and raped her. She had like broken bones in her face, lost vision in one eye. Like it was a real bad situation. Um. But the case against him personally was very weak. What happened is that the victim, while she was in the hospital, recovering from what had happened and on a lot of medication, had a dream that Clarence is who assaulted her. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so of course, you know, that points the police directly at him. He had a new trial in 2015. Um, well, I guess he got a new trial that was granted in 2015 and that was based on some newly discovered evidence. Some of which was that there was DNA in this case that the police destroyed before it was tested and then later, um, another man in prison actually confessed to this rape. Wow. So in 2016, a jury found him not guilty and he was released. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, of course, he's been trying to get compensated because sure. he should. Mm -hmm. If you serve 28 years in prison for something you did not do and there was, you know, malfeasance on the part of the police and somebody else has said they did this and like, come on. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's what's going on right now. And I find this really problematic. Um, she wants the judge to hear from her before he rules to basically give Clarence his money that he absolutely deserves. Mm hmm. I don't really understand why she has the right to do this because he's been exonerated of her. Assault. Right. Why should she get to say shit? Right. Um, they're saying Unless she has to give Clarence his money. That's the only thing she should say. Right. No, she's protesting the exoneration, which I mean, a jury found him not guilty in 2016. We're talking mm -hmm. seven years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to minimize what she's been through at all. It's just that this isn't the guy. He's right. not the guy who did it. She maintains that he is, even though there's absolutely no evidence that he is the person who did this. Mm -hmm. So she has a 10 page statement that she wants to read in court. Um, they're saying that she has a right to be heard a constitutional right to be heard by by a court under the Victim Rights Amendment. By a court. Okay. Just, but not this court. He's been exonerated. Right. Why are they allowing this? This is wrong. This statement should have been then. Not now. This is way wrong. Right. Or when they charge whoever actually did this. Like, what? Mm -hmm. why would this, why would they want this to muddy the waters for Clarence when he's already been exonerated of this? Right. So... She wishes to be heard regarding the exoneration of the petitioner, which, I mean, I don't get that at all because the, that's done and done. the jury's yeah. already found him not guilty. Mm -hmm. And payment to him of millions of dollars of state funds because she knows he is the person who attacked her. It, I, it, this bothers me a lot. Mm -hmm. He's a black man. I believe she's a white woman. Mm -hmm. This is really concerning. This case has Parents, been handled wrong from the get-go. When? Yeah. 
30 years, more than 30 years now. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Does she get to say anything at this hearing? Mm-hmm. This hearing is supposed to be about him and about mm-hmm. him, what he is owed mm-hmm. for being wrongly convicted. Yeah. You know, guys, I take a look at this, see what you think. It really bothers me. Me too. It's tremendously unfair to Clarence. Mm-hmm. He has been exonerated of her assault. So why her word at this court hearing has any right to be there, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. I don't either. And frankly, this dude's been through enough. He does not deserve this. And you know, that math is wrong. 70, he, okay, we're going to do the math here because I'm just thinking like 2,000, 2 million is not enough for $70,000 70, so per year for 28 years. Yeah. No, that's right. It's two million. Two million. Wow. I thought it would be more than that. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, I mean, she doesn't want him to get his money. She doesn't I don't I don't know, man. She's wrong. He didn't do it. Someone else confessed. Right. Someone else confessed. There was tampering on the part of the police. Like, come on. I don't know. I, I just don't think I, I it's not that I don't have empathy for her. Of course I do. But do I think she should get to interfere anymore in Clarence's life? No. Mm-hmm. Leave this guy alone. He didn't do it. It's, it's so, tremendously anyway. sad what happened to her. Tremendously. It is. It's horrific. But, but let's go for the person who actually did it and leave this mm-hmm. poor guy alone. Has he not had enough bullshit in his life already? Yep. You know? Yep. So that's my story. Okay. From there, I'll, I'll kick the mic back to you for a, a true crime update. Crime update. All right. All right. I now everybody knows Hello. job of unflavored gelatin is. <laughs> I mean, if you don't, I don't know where you've been. Right. With shredded carrots and a mayonnaise topping. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Josh yeah. Duggar, Josh F. Duggar. Mm-hmm. Top Josh, of the FOS list, as we all know. Uh, Josh is in prison currently on some really heinous child porn charges uh, that came from uh, some charges that he had uh, that he was looking at pornography, child pornography, and storing child pornography on his work computer. He had a car lot. Yeah. And he was busted and that computer was seized. He had set up uh, the security Linux partition thingy. Yeah, the Linux partition, which basically kind of splits your computer in half. Uh, because he had been in trouble uh, before with his wife uh, for being on the Ashley Madison site and having affairs. He'd also been in trouble long before that for molesting his sisters. But Josh has a long history of not being able to control himself oh. and yep. having some pretty serious sexual impulse issues. And But this was the first time he actually got, you know, criminal charges. Criminal charges, yeah. Yeah, the first time his parents just sent him away for a while and he had a harsh talk with a cop. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly it worked. Mm. No. Just a very concerning human. Yeah. Um, all the while, his wife, Anna has supported him, uh, visits him in the prison in Texas frequently. They have seven children, seven. Anna got pregnant and had another baby after Josh was charged with this stuff. Yeah. After. Think about She's that. She's not taking this seriously. Neither is Josh, in my opinion. And the reason I say that is because he has not taken any responsibility at all and daddy's money just keeps paying for his lawyers and they are appealing so here's what's so ironic about all of this right now a couple of weeks ago josh got in trouble at the prison why did he get in trouble for having a contraband phone he can't have a phone at the prison and because his crimes are of the nature that they are 
They do have internet for some inmates at that prison, but he's not one of them because he his crimes are internet crimes and crimes against children. So he has no access to the internet whatsoever. Or is but, supposed to have no access. Yeah. But uh, right now, or, or he has been for the last while because he's had a phone. <clears throat> so he's been placed in solitary because that's what happens at this prison when you are in trouble. Mm-hmm. So from solitary, he likely cannot have any visitors. He may have one phone call a month from what I'm researching. And the conditions are pretty crappy. Well, that's prison for you. Yeah, uh, way to be a pedophile. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could be on. there weeks, two months. He could be there many months uh, because he's he's getting charges for this. And now he's mm-hmm. going to have to deal with that. So all that is happening right now, which makes you go, huh, Josh Duggar hasn't learned a damn thing. Right. He is just as entitled as he's ever been and still thinks that he's above the rules and above the law. So obviously everyone's asking the same question. Where did that phone come from? Mm-hmm. Who is paying for the plan? Like, who else needs to catch a charge for Josh having a phone in prison? Is it Anna? Is it somebody at the jail or at the prison? Like, how did he get a phone? Bad. Yeah. And let's make sure that they get held accountable because we're all done with Josh thinking he can do whatever he wants to. But mm-hmm. here's what's so damn ironic about it. All the while that this is happening, his lawyers were filing for an appeal. <laughs> so the guy who can't even keep his nose clean in prison, can't even follow the most basic of rules, like you can't have a phone in here. And was he looking at porn? Like, right. really, what was going on? I mean, there would be one reason and one reason only he would want that damn phone. And mm-hmm. we all know what it is. Yep. So there's definitely that question, right? Well, anyway, all the while that his judge, his lawyers with a straight face are showing up in front of a judge saying that they want an appeal because their client was treated wrongfully and unfair. And ironically, it has to do with a phone. Part of it. They're saying that when he was initially uh, searched and questioned, that he tried to use his phone to call his attorney and that an FBI uh, agent took his phone from him and refused to give it back. And that that violates his rights to have an attorney present. No, it doesn't. Right. No, it doesn't. That's That phone is evidence... He can make a phone call, but it doesn't mm-hmm. mean it has to be on his phone. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, he's saying that he was denied the right to call, talk to his attorney and yada, yada, yada. We'll find out. These are grasping at scars. These guys are just still getting paid. So they're mm-hmm. coming up with stuff. Right. The other thing that they are arguing is that they did not get an adequate opportunity to question a distant cousin slash friend who worked for Josh who they swear it had to have been him, and he just set Josh up. The yeah. problem with that is that he had already alibied out and had proven that he was out of state when these things were downloaded onto this computer. Right. But they swear that that's not true and that's not fair and that they should have had an opportunity to uh, feel this person out and to question them. Uh, but law enforcement had already uh, ruled him out because he wasn't even in the state at the time that these crimes were committed. But those are the things. But it just, I can't get over how rich it is Mm -hmm. that at the same time that they're marching into court, acting all indignant and telling the judge about how unfair their client has been treated, their client's being thrown in solitary because he won't follow the rules. Right? Like, hello? Yeah. (laughs) Just shut up. What does that tell you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That Josh has learned nothing and Josh has no intention of stopping his behavior. For sure. Speaking of learning nothing, uh, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for an O Idaho case. <sighs> oh, murderous Idaho. <laughs> remember this guy because we've talked about him a lot. This is Gerald Pizzuto. Mm-hmm. Gerald Pizzuto has been on death row in Idaho since the 80s. He was convicted of the murder of three people. He was convicted of first degree murder and given the death penalty Mm -hmm. in the 80s. Now, there's Mm -hmm. been questions all along 
if Pizzuto really had the intellectual functioning to even qualify for the death penalty, because you can't, you can't execute people who are developmentally disabled. Well, I mean, you're not supposed to. Not supposed to. So here's the thing. Pizzuto has had a bunch of execution dates that just come and go. Nothing's, mm -hmm. Nothing happens. Until a couple of years ago, when Idaho went, we got to get to kill Gerald Pizzuto. Mm -hmm. And so try to execute him again. He went before the parole board because Gerald Pizzuto is dying. He is mm -hmm. very sick. He's dying of cancer and a bunch of other shit that's wrong with him. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's this question of, if Idaho didn't dare execute him clear up to now, why now? And why do we need to execute someone who's dying, who's been in prison for nearly 40 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So the parole board granted him clemency and they reduced his sentence from death penalty to life in, life in prison. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to tell you that uh, our sweet old governor didn't think that was good enough. No. And he said, oh, hell no. You don't get to tell him that he can't be executed. Only I can say that. Yeah. And this has gone back and forth in court and uh, clear to the Idaho Supreme Court. And now they finally said, yep, the governor can override the parole board, which I think is gross and disgusting that one human being can make that decision. It is wrong. It is not right. No. So last year year in December, they, they set a new execution date. It was December 15th. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Idaho does not have any drugs to do no. an execution. And they can't even do it. All that we have here is to execute him using the, the drug cocktail, right? Mm -hmm. No other form of um, execution is legal in this state. So another execution date go, comes and goes, right? In the meantime, George Pizzuto, or George, Gerald Pizzuto actually asked the court, can I just have firing squad? Can you just, can we just do the firing squad and get it over with? Well, no, because Idaho doesn't have firing squad in the law anymore. Part of the problem is that the lethal injection drugs that they will use will actually, because of Pizzuto's health, will actually cause him to be in a significant amount of pain during his execution, which I don't know, cruel and unusual. Remember that law? Right. Remember like that? it or not. Amendment. Um, right. Yeah. According to the constitution of these here United States, the death penalty cannot be cruel and unusual. Right. Which I don't know how murdering someone for the state is not cruel and unusual. But anyway, so now we have a new date for uh -huh. Pizzuto and it's in March. It's about a month from now. And Idaho says it's March 23rd is when they say they're going to get it done. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so uh, the IDOC director, Josh Tewalt, has informed the Board of Correction, the governor's office and the attorney general's office that the department is not in possession of the chemicals necessary to carry out an execution by lethal injection. No shit, Sherlock. We've been here before. Mm -hmm. Efforts to lawfully source chemicals are ongoing. <laughs> I mean, the last time they needed drugs was back in 2011. And they flew to Washington in a private jet and did a little backdoor cash transaction. So that they could yeah. execute Pollers or Rhodes, who was a local serial killer, and another guy, I can't remember his right. name. From a compounding pharmacist. Yeah, who basically made the drugs. Mm -hmm. And they met him in a Walmart parking lot at 10 p.m. and gave him a briefcase full of cash. 20K, I believe. Or yeah. maybe they did this twice. They did it in Utah once and they did it in Washington once. Yeah. One time they paid 20K. I think the other time they actually paid 35K. So does that sound like lawfully getting the drugs needed for lethal injection? Because no, it doesn't. That sounds like a drug deal. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so here we sit yet again. 
with poor dying Gerald Pizzuto. And I'm mm-hmm. not minimizing his crimes. I just don't understand why we need to be so bloodthirsty. The state has opted to not execute this guy many times in the past. Gerald Pizzuto was convicted the same year I was born. Yeah. And for oh, all this 70s, time. not 80s. Oh, I was thinking 70s. For Jeez. all this time that he has been in prison and on death row, they could have executed him a billion times and haven't. Yeah. But now that he's dying, they are desperately scrambling to be able to execute him. And, make and that make sense. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's gross. It's bloodthirsty. It makes me sick. Mm-hmm. Our stupid governor. W- give me a break. Like, come yeah. on. You know, Pizzuto hasn't been a danger to anybody in 50 friggin' years. Like, yeah, I guess not 50 years. How old are you? 46. 46 years. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, 45. Sorry. (laughs) You're 45. And he hasn't been a danger to anybody in 45 years. I'm 46. But yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Agreed. It is. It makes me sick. Pisses me off. Idaho, do better. Please. And with that, Katie, we have another Oido. No, a true crime update. Oh, a true crime update. I'm sorry. I got him out of order. That's okay. Let's do that. This is Jeff Titus. Jeff Titus alone, his case could make the case for true crimers Mm -hmm. like you and me. Jeff Titus has been in prison since on two 1990 murders. Mm -hmm. He was in prison for almost 21 years. His case was one of those that made no damn sense. And Mm -hmm. a podcast started looking at his case and looking at how it did not seem like it was uh, correct that his rights had been violated. And they were violated in trial in 2002 because his lawyer was never informed that sheriff's investigators in Kalamazoo County had gathered evidence years earlier against someone else, Thomas Dillon, who was a serial killer. Mm, So there was a huge Brady violation here. Because they had evidence that it wasn't him. And they didn't share it with his attorney. It was two hunters that were shot and killed. He had an alibi that he was hunting 27 miles away with someone else when these two men were shot. Mm -hmm. There was a witness whose story jumped all over the place and changed multiple times. There was really no evidence against him. The only real evidence they had is that these two were shot. Their names were Doug Estes and Jim Bennett near his property. He was initially cleared as a suspect and then 12 years later, they arrest him and convict him for a crime he didn't commit. Wow. So from the podcast, it was uh, a discovery podcast. Uh, The Innocence Clinic went to bat for him. And in 2018, they went to court arguing that his constitutional rights had been violated because of the Brady violation. And while their appeal was pending, another discovery was made in boxes at the sheriff's office about this case. A 30-page file from the original investigation that referred to an alternative suspect. Dylan. They knew who it was the whole time. The About whole time. Brady violation. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's disgusting. In the meantime, Dylan had pled guilty to killing five people in Ohio who were hunting and fishing or jogging from 1989 to 1992. My God. And he died in 2011. Oh. Yeah. The file also revealed that a woman and her son had talked to Ohio investigators and identified Dylan as a the as the shooter. They the person who 
was the shooter had wrecked their car in a ditch near the scene in mm-hmm. Michigan. This happened in Michigan. And the woman just identified Dylan and described the car. And that car is owned, was owned by Dylan's wife. Wow. A man who shared a jail cell with Dylan in 93 told the FBI that Dylan had talked about killing two people in the woods there. They had a ton of evidence against him. And instead, and he was a freaking serial killer. And instead, they just went ahead and convicted Jeff Titus with completely faulty logic, without very much evidence, and with a witness that flopped back and forth all over the place. So because that Discovery Investigation uh, podcast ran his story and started poking around, he's a free man. He's finally been released. This is why this kind of work is so important. It is. And I'm not saying that we go on those deep of dives. We typically don't. Maybe someday we will. But this is why. Is true crime podcasting problematic? Yes. Are there some ethics concerns? Definitely. Is it important? Yeah. And cases like this are exactly why. I think about Adnan Syed. Right. And I think about this case and others where podcasters were asking the hard questions. Podcasters were getting the FOIAs. The podcasters were looking at the old evidence and making some connections. And I just couldn't be happier for Jeff Titus. I am still so sad for the families of the victims. I'm very sad that the murderer is dead. Uh, but I'm sure glad for Jeff that he can at least start trying to get some semblance of his life back. Right. Now, where's his settlement? Oh, I'm sure it'll be forthcoming. Mm-hmm. Brady violations? Whoa. Oh, yeah, that that's huge. so bad. That is so freaking bad. This is the other reason, though, why I genuinely think that we should federally do away with the death penalty. Mm-hmm. What if he'd been given the death penalty? What if yeah. he had been executed and all of this information was just sitting in some evidence room somewhere yeah you can never be 100 percent sure unless the entire thing is on video mm-hmm. which we know happens now but now, old cases but back then it didn't no yeah. and it still doesn't in every situation but mm-hmm. short of that we can never know for sure yeah. And we have most definitely executed innocent people in this country. Certainly. And continue to run the risk. Mm-hmm. Why? One yep. is too many. And we're mm-hmm. way beyond one at this mm-hmm. point. Absolutely. That's just sickening. Well, I'm glad for Jeff Titus. Me too. That he can be released. But, you know, putting someone in prison for that many years does unbelievable damage cycle oh yeah well and for poor jeff i mean does he have anything left right does he have any family what's he gonna do he's never had the opportunity to develop a career build a family you know well, i believe he did i mean he's he's in his 70s and he went to prison 21 years ago well yeah so he was he did 50 have when things. he went to prison but does but that it's all remain? gone at this yeah. point yeah to have to start over like that Yeah. We cannot trust our legal system. And I know that we want to feel like we can, but we cannot trust our legal system to the point of putting people to death. No. Because this kind of shit happens all the time. Mm -hmm. This is a regular occurrence. Mm -hmm. We reported on two just in this episode. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Ah. Yep. Drives me crazy. Really frustrating. Yep. Well, with that, Christy, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for some WTF news. Oh, yes. You know, I know it can be aggravating to go through a drive through and not get everything you ordered. I get it. I've been there. Oh. I'm furious about it before. However, usually if they just make it right for me, mm-hmm. it's fine. I can move on. Right. Not, not this woman. 
not this woman. Mm. This, is, this happened in Georgia. Uh, this was Belinda Miller in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, she got irate at Popeye's. And I know this is pretty sacrilegious, but they forgot to give her her biscuits. And I know that the Popeye's biscuits are a big deal. She was seriously pissed. And she was still pissed even after they fixed it, which I just don't get. Like, it's not like it was intentional. Right. No. And if you're that mad, don't go there every, any, ever again. Right. Go find and a different Popeyes or go to KFC. Exactly. But well, and these restaurants are mostly manned by teenagers. They're doing right. the best they can. You know, mistakes are going to happen. Yeah. So she dro drove away for a while and then she came back. Mm hmm. And uh, she crashed her vehicle into the entrance of the restaurant. She was driving an SUV. Mm -hmm. She nearly hit an 18-year-old employee who was, you know, standing inside there doing his job. She drove four feet into the building. It wasn't just hit the building. It was, I'm going to drive through this bitch, right? Mm -hmm. She got four feet in and then couldn't go any further because, like, I don't know, the building was falling down around her and mm -hmm. uh, her car couldn't go any further. Luckily. So, yeah, fortunately for what anyone else. What was she going to do? Drive up to the uh, counter and demand some more biscuits? I know. Right? The end game here, Belinda. Really? What right. was it? What was it? So um, police showed up there about 7.45 p.m. Um, to what they thought at the time was an, a, an accident, which definitely mm. was not an accident. Um, she actually pulled out of the store and driven away. She just, mm -hmm. she did that. And then she drove off. Uh -huh. Like, come on, lady. First of all, video. Everybody just witnessed it. They know who you are because you bitched him out over the biscuits. Uh -huh. you, she just drove her car home. Yep. So police well, show she'd up She'd also there. called them. She had also called them and let them know she was oh, going right. to be driving through their building. She did yeah. that. And then she genuinely did it, which most uh -huh. people would not think she would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So police, you know, went to her house and found that her vehicle had some pretty significant front end damage, I mm -hmm. imagine. So she was arrested and booked into jail. She's charged with aggravated assault and first degree criminal damage to property. Her bail was set at $4,000, which I don't think is nearly high enough because she literally could have killed people doing what she was doing. It, how do you know who's standing there or what part of the building is going to fall down on somebody? You know, this mm -hmm. seems like a attempted murder to me more yeah. than just assault, but um, so we don't know. Oh yeah. She, <laughs> she had told someone waiting in line to hurry and get their order because she was coming back. And then she called them and said she was coming back and she was driving her car through their restaurant. And that's exactly what she did. Yep. So um, I just don't think the biscuits of Popeye's are good enough for that. I mean, lady, you need to chill out. Are those biscuits good and enough for prison? Apparently they are. Apparently, because it's not like there's any question you did it. Yeah. I don't even know what to say to that. Other than I'm real, so I'm real, real tired of the uh, Karens of the world doing shit mm -hmm. like this, what yep. makes you think you have the right to destroy that restaurant and endanger the employees and customers like that? Yep. This is the most arrogant, ignorant crap I've heard in a long time. Mm -hmm. So Belinda, I think you get what you deserve in this situation. Mm -hmm. Speaking of getting what you deserve, Katie, have <laughs> got a little old Idaho for us, as I recall. Indeed. This withered up old uh, hot air balloon <laughs> is a man named Robin Dunn. Yeah. Robin Dunn is a well-known prosecutor and city attorney in our area. Yeah. He ha was the uh, prosecuting attorney in Jefferson County for something like 25 years mm -hmm. and was also the city attorney in Jefferson County or in, in Rigby. Uh, at the same time for mm -hmm. a, a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has been here for a long time. Prosecuting attorney for 34 years, excuse me. 
and was also the city attorney for something like 25 years. Uh, not too long ago, like literally a couple of months ago, he left his job as the Rigby city attorney. Uh, he'd already left his job as the prosecutor and went to be, strangely, the city attorney for two tiny little towns, also in Jefferson County, mm -hmm. uh, Ryrie and Roberts. Yeah. Well, a couple of weeks ago, he was arrested. And I want to tell you about the charges because it's pretty shocking and I think extremely concerning because mm -hmm. this man has wielded a lot of power in Jefferson County for a long, 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 long time. He sure has. In fact, one of our clients sent us this story and said, is this the Idaho equivalent of Alex Murdoch? In some ways. Is it? Well, time will tell, maybe. But here's what happened. He's 67 years old, by the way. Uh, he's been charged, not convicted, but charged, with felony possession of a controlled substance, misdemeanor possession of a controlled substance, misdemeanor possession of drug use, Oh, misdemeanor possession or use of drug paraphernalia and misdemeanor resisting or obstructing officers. Well, he was pulled, he was in a car in Idaho Falls at Sherry's. We have a Sherry's in Idaho Falls. Someone had called the police and said that there was a woman who was very high on dirty 30s, which is fentanyl pills, and that she, uh, shouldn't be driving and was behind the wheel of a car so the police show up and indeed there's a woman named vivian exler behind the wheel who is definitely not safe to drive and they start looking into her well she's literally currently facing felony charges on control on controlled substances she's already in trouble yeah uh, her attorney by the way is none other than Robin Dunn. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? So she's sitting in the car with her attorney, and she is high as a freaking kite. So the officers notice a red straw with a burnt end on the floorboard behind the driver's seat and an opened roll of aluminum foil on the rear passenger seat. So mm -hmm. they ask Dunn if he would be willing to take her home if she can't drive, which she cannot, and he said yes, he would. So they bring another officer with a canine to perform a free air sniff of the car, meaning that they don't have uh, a warrant to bring the dog into the car, but the dog can walk around the car and sniff the air and see if they hit on anything. Mm -hmm. So as the canine gets to the front passenger door, Dunn opens the door. So the officer tells him to close it and he refuses to. So the officer tries to close it and Dunn blocks it and won't let him shut the door. Here's why it matters. This is a former prosecutor and a defense attorney and he knows damn well that a canine cannot during a free air sniff cross the thre threshold of the car and enter any part of the car. And if they did, that would basically void the, uh, the sniff. It, yeah. it would void the smell. So he opened the door, they believe, to try to, uh, basically to ruin that. Yeah, to invalidate the search. Mm -hmm, to make the search for the narcotics invalid. Uh, luckily, the officer had good control of the dog, and he never did cross the threshold. And the dog did indicate that there were illegal drugs inside the vehicle. So they pull out Exler and they search her. She's got nothing. So then they decide they better search done. So they pull him out of the car. And this part of the article, I think, is very strange. I, I still don't know what this is. They found an unknown object in his right pants pocket, which was approximately four inches long and had a hard edge. They asked him what it was, and he refused to let them take it out of his pocket. And he said he didn't know what it was, but maybe it was his wallet. <laughs> you don't know what a four inch long, hard edged something in your pocket is? Right. But you can't let the police see it. So yeah. manipulate the object from outside his pants and felt confident it wasn't a dangerous weapon. I mean, honestly, 
the privilege they're showing him at this point is pretty amazing. It's way too much. Anybody else, they would have just searched him, taken it out. But not for Mr. Dunn. Well, in his upper shirt pocket, they find Narcan and a clear baggie that has several fentanyl pills, the Dirty 30s, and some crumpled up aluminum foil in his left pants pocket. This is what I don't understand. They get all of that stuff out of his pocket, but the hard-edged thing... They can't get out because he doesn't want them to see it. They're searching him with cause. What the hell does that even mean? That means the good old boys club strikes again. Mm -hmm. So they ask him if he has any more illegal items on him. And he says no. So then they make sure he realizes um, they're taking him to jail and he's going to be searched there. And if he's lying, then that's just going to be worse for him. So then he admits to having some illegal items in his boot. So they take his boot off and there are 30 more Dirty 30s and several other pills like Xanax and Al Alprazolam and other stuff. Hmm. So I wonder where, where uh, Ms. Exeter is getting her drugs. Weird. From her own attorney? Oh. Yeah. Huh. She didn't have any drugs on her. He was covered yeah. in them. Yeah. So they take him obviously to jail and he's booked and he's charged and his his bail is set to thirty thousand dollars. It sounds like he bonded right out. Uh so now he goes to press or he goes to trial. He's going uh, April fourth is his preliminary hearing. If he's convicted, he could face up to ten years in prison and eighteen thousand dollars in fines. Why does it matter? Because this guy was a prosecutor for 34 years. Yeah. Because this guy was the city attorney. He's still a city attorney. He has had pull and sway with the police for decades. How well, long what, has this kind of shit been going on? Currently? Yeah. And what is their involvement in, I don't know, selling drugs in our community? Yeah. That's now, horrible. obviously, he is innocent until proven guilty. No. These are just the things we know from the arrest affidavit right. and from the article that East Idaho News published on this, because frankly, East Idaho News has been pretty unflinching in, you know, calling out corruption when they see it and, and not playing the good old boys club game to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust them to continue to investigate him. They will. We don't really have the means to. Uh, but I'm going to trust them that they're going to, because mm -hmm. I think our communities are owed that at this point. I would imagine that the prosecutor's office in Jefferson County and the city attorney's office know plenty. I would also imagine that they would like none of that to surface, because how many trials, how many cases, how many situations here could we be looking at that have been done illegally or incorrectly how long or just could be challenged because right it could be challenged now yeah exactly how long has he been dealing drugs yeah. and also what's going on with his cust or his uh clients yeah what's going what's on he with defending and what's going on with them mm -hmm. not to mention the cities that he is apparently responsible to and I think there's a lot to learn, and I'm really glad that this happened in Bonneville County mm -hmm. because hopefully they will be unflinching in investigating him and that the prosecution will there. This, the search makes me nervous. That whole mm -hmm. part of the search makes me think. Mm -hmm. They couldn't, whatever was in his pocket, they couldn't have let him go into the jail with it. Or into the cop car with it, right? Right. It's weird that that's where that story ends. Right, that they don't the say what that it is because they say what yeah. everything else that was in his pockets is. Why? Right. Why is that? Or was it was it just drug paraphernalia? He was charged on several drug paraphernalia charges, so maybe. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a little bit weird. The vagueness uh, of it, it, it makes it very questionable. Yeah. So we're going to keep a close eye on this one because, frankly, our community deserves that. They deserve yeah. to know what the hell's been going on with the prosecutors here. Absolutely. So to be clear, in case you're wondering, because some of you will ask, this is not a county that has anything to do with the Daybell Vallow case. Mm -mm. Just, yep. to, 
just to, it's a it's a yeah. neighboring Rob county, Dunn didn't but have not anything that to county. do with that case. No. It hasn't had anything to do with that case at all. No, he wouldn't have. So, just to make that one clear, because I know some of you guys will wonder, but uh, no, this is a different county that's clearly got some pretty significant issues. Yeah. So, well, there you have it. That was a mouthful. Mm -hmm. We have two brand new Patreons coming out. Uh, here in the next day or so. So keep an eye on those. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we'll be back tomorrow and our episode will be all about what happened in court. Yeah. So keep an eye out. Big things are happening. Maybe yes, yeah. we think. Who knows? Something. This Something case is. Was disappointed bigly before. So we don't know. Yeah, but right. We have, yeah. we have high hopes. <laughs> we do. Voluminous. Our hopes are voluminous. Let's say it that way. Yes. That's a good way to say it. <laughs> All righty, guys. Thanks for listening. As always, like, share, follow. Uh, please leave a nice comment. That would be neat. And yeah. thanks for being here. <laughs> this has been yet another production of the True Crime Squad. Take care. Bye, everybody.